Hey all, thank you so much. And just so you know, Stacy and I are not sitting next to each other. There's actually a, a, an acrylic in between us, so we are maintaining COVID uh, distance. Um, I just wanna thank you so much for being here and joining us. Uh, we are in the process of uh, seven years, finishing seven years with the city of Long Beach. Um, it was the very first fully put together RTF program in Southern California. And we have had nothing but absolute success on so many different levels, not just with RTF, but freeing up resources for other programs, uh, teaching the staff how to deal with fractious cats, scared cats, how to better house them. We have just really excited that this partnership works so well. And just real quickly, I wanted to share our numbers in Long Beach. So return to field, which means the cat originated in the shelter and then was released back into his community exactly where he came from, vaccinated, ear tipped, microchipped, and of course fixed. We did in seven years from the shelter, 1,809 cats. Part of our program and a very important part that I'm sure Dr. Hurley will talk more on is the targeted TNR. And what targeted TNR is, is that when cats and kittens came in from very high impact areas, meaning that the shelter was just constantly taking animals in from that area, that was where we would target. And we did 3,635 of those for a total of 5,444 cats. Uh, for the city of Long Beach and our contract cities of Cerritos, Signal Hill, and uh, Los Alamitos. And we're super proud of those numbers. As you know, we've also uh, done Orange County for two years and Garden Grove. So our actual total RTF numbers for all of our programs over a seven year period are 9,475 cats impacted. And you'll see on Dr. Hurley's slides, that it's not just that number, it's really about the babies that are not born, that uh, it really is where the impact is. So thank you for all of you that have supported us. Thank you for being here tonight to learn more. Uh, RTF is the future. It is the future for maintaining and controlling community cats. And we are so excited to be part of it. And I'm gonna hand it over to Stacy now. Thank you, Anna. Uh, we are very fortunate here in the city of Long Beach um, to be able to partner with uh, Stray Cat Alliance. And I, wanted, I want to really underscore um, to those of you joining how important it is um, to really be open to these programs that come into your community um, and to really find ways to partner with the uh, individuals and advocates that want to help and make a difference. Um, I think my work as a director in animal services has really been to help facilitate the compassionate desires of the members of our community. Um, and so many times um, as directors, we can feel like obstacles. So when we give ourselves the freedom to, you know, allow the community to really expand its compassion and really extend its desire to help, um, we'll see a great um, impact for the community. Um, you know, without the work of Stray Cat Alliance and the RTF program here for the city of Long Beach, we would not have seen our way to any other programs. We, we would have been continuing to deal with um, the enormous number of cats that would come in. Our shelter would see anywhere between six and 8,000 cats coming in every year. Uh, and most of those cats would be euthanized. So today, uh, because of the work of Stray Cat Alliance, we have been able to do in-shelter foster programs and to partner with other organizations to help save the lives of the most vulnerable animals in our shelter. Specifically, we were able to do a kitten nursery program called Long Beach Little Paws with one of our local nonprofits called Little Lion Foundation. And their work has enabled us to save an additional thousand cats over the last two years. Uh, we never would have been able to do that if Stray Cat Alliance hadn't come into our community to make this life-saving work possible. So um, it really is an opportunity to do more and more and gain your confidence in life-saving. So I really want to uh, thank Stray Cat Alliance for all of their support and mentorship for our city and our animal shelter. 
and definitely for um, Dr. Kate Hurley to join us this evening. Um, she is uh, the director for shelter medicine programs at UC Davis. Um, and her expertise in this area of shelter medicine um, and especially stray cats and how to responsibly manage populations has been absolutely groundbreaking and front running. So we appreciate all of the work and research that she has done in this field for all animals, um, not only cats. And we want to welcome you and thank you for being here with us tonight. And we are going to hand it over to you. Take it away. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate you having me here and all the people who are tuned in either now or or sometime in the future, taking your time to learn more about what has been an absolute game changer for cats, um, both in shelters and in terms of having a real effective tool to manage cats in communities. Um, I've been doing this for quite a long time. I became an animal control officer when I was 24 years old. Um, I became the first person in the world to specialize in shelter medicine um, after I graduated from veterinary school. And I never imagined that I would have a tool so powerful to share with the field that I love. So as programs like the one in Long Beach have matured, we have come to understand even more how the many different ways in which return to field um, can not only support cats that don't need to be in the shelter, but help cats that do need to be in the shelter and help stabilize the bond between families and the animals they love and reduce the overall harmful impact of cats in communities. So it really has emerged as an extraordinarily win-win solution. Um, and I think one of the biggest challenges around it is just the ways in which it's sort of counterintuitive. Um, how effective it can be. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Because I have these two tools here, a hairdryer and a hammer. Um, and when I started in sheltering for cats, all we had was the hammer. We brought cats into the shelter and we either found them homes or we euthanized them. And a few percentages will be would be returned to their owners. Um, and so we use that for everything. You know, if, you, if all you got is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. We used it to hammer and nails. Sometimes it was the right solution for cats, but we also used it to dry our hair. And, you know, when you're using a hammer to dry your hair, it hurts like crazy. And it also just doesn't work very well. And with return to field, it's like we got a hair dryer. And now our challenge becomes just understanding when is the hammer the right tool? When is shelter admission? and either return to the owner or rehoming into an adoptive home or relocation to a working cat home. When is that the right answer? And when is return to field the right answer? When should we pick up our hammer? When should we break out the hair dryer? And when we get that right, it works so much better and it hurts so much less. So first I wanna ground us in just, um, what are the cat numbers that we're dealing with? Um, we just heard some big numbers in the thousands, and that's just in one community over a few years. And we think there's about 75 to 95 million pet cats, the vast majority of which are sterilized, and potentially half as many to almost the same number of unowned cats. Importantly, only 2% of those are sterilized. So we know which population is contributing most to breeding, cat overpopulation, and the impacts of cats on wildlife and ecosystems and community nuisance issues, and the risks suffered by cats themselves, right? It's that second group that's unowned. Um, and also importantly, less than 5% of those cats are in colonies. So a lot of the controversy around cats tends to center around large groups of cats, but most of the cats that we see out and about that come into shelters are not part of colonies. They're just existing in ones and twos and threes in people's backyards and alleys and around dumpsters. And so they have tended to elude traditional TNR programs because they've been sort of invisible. And so one of the great benefits of return to field programs has been in enabling us to more effectively target traditional TNR efforts by identifying where the cats are living when they're not part of colonies. And one thing to be a bit aware of is that um, unlike, you know, when you look at a dog, you know if it's a lost pet or a coyote, right? They look different. 
But with cats, they look just the same, whether they are dependent on humans for food and care, or whether they're doing, they're doing just fine on their own, and they're really never going to intersect with human society. And cats can move fluidly between those three groups of cats. But one thing I think we all can agree on, and this is an article that was sort of critical of cats, but we would agree that when we make management decisions about cats, it needs to be informed by research that allows an analysis of the population responses of cats and assessment of the success of particular management actions. And that's not a standard that we really applied to the traditional sheltering model that I participated in starting when I was 24. Right? We never did a scientific study to say what happens when we have the public bring in cats to this animal shelter and we find them homes or if we can't do that, we euthanize them humanely. We didn't determine whether that was beneficial, whether it was neutral, whether it was harmful. And that's surprising because this is the biggest public investment we make in domestic pet management is really the operation of our animal shelters, right? So let's apply that standard. And I'm gonna go through, you know, sort of that standard applying it both to our traditional method of impoundment and, and adoption or impoundment and sterilization and return. But let's set this as sort of, this is the, the bar that we're trying to reach, right? We will be successful if we can do these things. Um, you know, I'm, I'm the co-founder of the Million Cat Challenge, which was a successful campaign to say, increase life-saving success at North American animal shelters by a million cats. Um, when I last checked the counter, we actually had exceeded two and three quarters million more lives saved. So I am, I come at this as a cat advocate. I love cats. But I also come at this as a former field officer and sergeant of field services at an animal shelter. And I understood that there was an obligation to resolve complaints for people in the community, to relieve nuisance issues, to protect public health, to return turn lost cats to their owners, to find new homes for cats that need them, to protect the welfare of cats, and to reduce the harm caused by cats. The predation, the impact on wildlife, as well as the impact on human health, and ultimately our big goal that we all share, whether you love cats or loathe them, is to reduce the number of free roaming cats overall, right? But remember how many cats there were, 30 to 80 million free roaming community cats in the United States and another 75 to 95 million pet cats. That amounts to up to as much as like one cat for every three to 10 people in communities. So that's a lot of cats. That's tens of thousands even in a small community. Um, and that brings us to this concept of harm reduction, which recognizes that we may not have a perfect strategy. And I can tell you right now, spoiler alert, we don't have a strategy available to us that's of reasonable cost and could actually be practically enacted that would remove free roaming cats from our community. We don't have a way to sort of wipe free roaming cats off the face of the earth or gather them all into homes. There's too many of them and they're too prolific. But we recognize in many areas of public health and environmental management that imperfect but effective strategies can actually have a greater benefit than hypothetically preferred but realistically unattainable outcomes. And so some examples are clean needle exchange for IV drug users or access to birth control for teens. Clean needle exchange um, results in lower infection rates and transmission of serious and fatal diseases for drug users than a program that just focuses on abstinence. Like we don't want people to do drugs, but given the reality that they will do drugs, sometimes it's best to give them a way to do it more safely. We don't want teens having um, unprotected sex with each other. We don't want them to get pregnant. But in fact, it's been shown that birth control and education programs actually do a better job of reducing pregnancy than abstinence only focused programs. And so with cats also, it would be great if we had a perfect solution, but we shouldn't cast aside any imperfect solution if it will bring us closer to the, all those valuable outcomes that we're trying to achieve. So here I am, same haircut, same bad haircut, uh, 30 years ago. I actually, I moonlighted at a dog grooming salon and that's a schnauzer cut number three, uh, if you want to get that replicated. 
um, when it's safe to, you know, COVID safe to go out to the dog shop again. Um, I was really invested in all of those good goals that we had. Um, and so, you know, what I knew to achieve those good goals was, I'm gonna bring the cat into the shelter. And my very first choice is give her a chance to get back to her owner, right? That's why we have stray holding periods at shelters is because that's the first choice. That's our first sort of mandate from the public is every animal should have a chance to get back to the people that love that animal. So I'd set her up in a cage and I'd, I'd take a good picture and write her up and we'd post the notice so people could know that the cat was at the shelter. We'd hold her for a few days and then if she didn't get reclaimed by her owner, next choice was adoption. And maybe I'd like put some fancy curtains on her cage and write up a cute personality profile. And then if she didn't get adopted, that was sad, but sometimes I did this myself. Um, we would humanely euthanize the cats, not because we hated cats or we didn't care, but because we understood that that was the alternative to a place we would not go, which is allowing the cats to experience suffering and death in the community or cause unacceptable problems for wildlife or members of the public. So that was, that was our pathway. And it was our pathway, it had been our pathway for many decades when I came into this and it remained our pathway for another decade as I went off to vet school and became a shelter medicine specialist and eventually got into the business of consulting with animal shelters myself. Um, this is about 15 years after that picture was taken same bad haircut, um, <laughs> went with a team, um, including some other veterinarians from the University of Florida and Cornell. And we consulted with the shelter in Jacksonville, Florida. And you can see the sort of desperate conditions for cats that were inside the shelter. Um, There's crowding, there was sickness. Uh, you could see, you know, just how stressed the cats were. Some cats, sometimes stray cats that didn't come in together were caged together because there was just no more room. And again, it wasn't because the staff was uncaring or lazy, um, but underlying all of that was this fundamental imbalance between the cats that were coming in and the cats that were leaving alive. And these red bars are their euthanasia rates in 2007, the year before we arrived. You can see in some months, they actually reached or exceeded 100% because they were catching up from the month before. That was a hard place to work, right? Hard place to retain caring staff and volunteers. But we noticed that just a couple of months before we arrived, euthanasia had gone down. Not a lot, but a meaningful amount, right? For the first time ever, it was below 80% below 70%. And so we asked, what's, what's going on? And this is what is happening. If cats came in in good body condition, in traps, instead of being brought into the shelter and held for a stray holding period and tried to be put up for adoption and euthanized if they weren't adopted, they were in good body condition, no matter what the intention of the person who found them, they were sterilized, vaccinated, ear tipped and returned the place we were that, that they were found. And the animal control officer in me was like, you can't do that. You know, people are gonna freak out and there's just gonna be cats everywhere piled by the side of the road. We're gonna be buried in a layer of cats, 12 feet deep, like that's not gonna work. But they were doing it because they didn't know any better. And this is what happened to their live release rate. This is their live release rate. Um, and you know, I know those of you who are familiar with Long Beach's success in the last few years, it's gonna be hard to see and hard to believe, but barely ever past 20%. Then the following year with this program, you can see that it reached even as high as 80% in the very first months of the program. So I was like, well, yeah, that's great. But what about all the problems that are happening out in the community? Aren't these cats just being returned to go on suffering and creating the same news and situations that were happening before. And this is another excerpt from that very first article. Might not seem like a logical answer at first, but Jacksonville's animal care organizations say the best way to reduce the number of feral cats is to keep them alive. That is the first counterintuitive part of this. How could it be 
that sterilizing and returning cats would actually make there be fewer cats than removing and either relocating or euthanizing the cats. Doesn't make sense. But a shelter in California, close to, close to where I work in Davis, decided to give it a try. I think they were the second shelter in the country to give it a try. Um, and again, so the shelter and Audubon Society, we ultimately all have the same goal to see fewer feral and stray cats in the world. Over time, with enough cooperation from people, the trap and release method will work. The alternative is to continue euthanizing cats that don't have owners, a policy that's shown limited results. Okay, let's give it a try. Let's create a new pathway. Return to owner, adoption. And before we get to humane euthanasia, let's have another option, a return to field. I was still skeptical, but then remember going back to sort of that principle as a scientist is that the methods we use should stand up to scientific scrutiny and we should look at the impact of different strategies. And so here was the paper published after several years of that program. And again, you can see we are getting into some significant numbers similar to what's been done in Long Beach. Over 10,000 cats sterilized and returned. Euthanasia down 75% was not a big surprise, right? Euthanasia down due to upper respiratory infection, down 99%. That did good to my veterinarian's heart. But here were the really interesting results. Cats picked up dead on the road. Not increased as I sort of expected by putting the cats back, but actually down by 20%. One fifth less cats running around getting hit by cars. And that was with no change in dead cat pickup practices or field staffing. So that's evidence that by using this new method, we actually reduce the number of cats being hit by car and dying on the streets. That's profound because that means not using that method might be increasing by 20% the number of cats needlessly dying and getting hit by cars, right? And here was the most impressive part. Remember that counterintuitive theory that there might be fewer cats if we sterilize and return instead of remove? Intake of both cats and kittens was down almost 30%. And that was in spite of the fact that kittens were not part of this program. So that's a measure that suggests that breeding of cats in that community was somehow stabilized by this program. And this is not a fluke. Here's another, another even larger program that sterilized more cats over a shorter period. Euthanasia went down even more. Calls for dead cat pickup went down even more. And intake went down by almost 40%. So what's happening here? I went back to the literature because that's what I do because I'm a scientist and I have access to an amazing library of thousands and thousands of papers that I can read and reread. And here's one that I read a few times. When coyotes were removed from the environment as a method of coyote control, when a large percentage of coyotes were removed, sure enough, the coyote population went down for a little while. But then what happened? It rebounded with increasing prey and reducing coyote density, litter size doubled. That's what litter bearing mammals do. That's their whole evolutionary strategy. More food, less competition, let's have more babies. And the really paradoxical thing is that the environment can actually support more younger individuals. So removing all those coyotes, not only did it not decrease the coyote population in a long-term way, it actually allowed it to increase beyond what it had been by destabilizing the age structure. So that's coyotes. I took this theory and made this little animation about cats as an example of how this might play out in our world. We know that about one in seven Americans admits to feeding cats that they don't own. And that's not even including all the people who have got a bowl of dog food on the back porch or an uncovered trash can or a dumpster with a bunch of delicious food in it. So there's food out there and we can't regulate our way out of that situation. And so just imagine if there's say the equivalent of six bowls of food in an alley somewhere and there's three intact female cats. And imagine that for every bowl of food that's available, each cat can have one kitten. 
on average. There's an R on all these cats because they're not vaccinated for rabies. And there's an R and a T on the kittens because toxoplasmosis is a significant human health concern and cats are the only natural host that can shed that pathogen. But they tend to get infected early in life the first time they eat an infected prey animal. They shed for about two weeks and then they develop substantial immunity that will protect them for the rest of their lives. So it's a disease of the youngsters. So three adult cats, six kittens, all of them can transmit rabies and, uh, and the kittens can transmit toxoplasmosis. So what happens if we take one of those cats away? Doesn't matter if we relocate her to a desert island to live out her life or, or she ends up euthanized, right? We didn't have an opportunity to go and identify the food source and make sure it's reduced by one third because we don't know where she was getting her food. and We can't interview her to tell us that. So the food is still there. We didn't remove all the cats because there's too many for us to do that. And so more food, litter bearing mammal, more kittens, right? All that effort and we're on the same hamster wheel as before, same number of kittens coming into the animal shelter, same level of public health risk, same level of harm to wildlife and same number of kittens at risk in the community for being hit by cars and all other things we worry about happening to cats. So. Now watch this one closely because it's a fancy animation I spent a long time on. What if instead, pick up that cat, sterilize her, ear tip her, vaccinate her for rabies, and put her back? Voila, you want to see that again? Watch that ear tip cl closely. Ta-da! Now what happens? We don't know what the food source was. But the cat, by definition of being in good body condition when she came into the shelter, that tells us she knows. And what we discovered is if we put her back where she was found, without her ovaries, so she can't get into any more trouble that way, she will go find that food and she will keep eating it. And she will reduce the functional carrying capacity of the environment in a way that we never could. And instead, Next year, instead of six kittens, we have four. We have a reduction by 30% in the number of kittens being born in the community. Looks an awful lot like what happened in those return to field programs, right? Once they had been going on for a few years. And better yet, if we have a partnership like there is between Long Beach and the Stray Cat Alliance, where we can use that cat to lead us to where there might be a couple more cats, we could sterilize the other two cats as well and even further stabilize that situation over time. That's the theory. This is an animation that I put together. And it was actually a few years later after I did this animation that this study came out of Tasmania where they actually took the time to track the impact of what we've been doing in shelters in the United States for over a hundred years, which is randomly removing some of the cats from the environment without eradicating the whole population and without removing the food source. But they did something that we've never done, which is they used cameras to identify every single individual cat present before the removal and after, and they compared it to sites where there was no removal at all. And the results shocked them. They thought that removing as much as 30% of the cats might not lead to substantial population reductions, but what actually happened is that the populations at the removal sites increased by as much as 200%. Yes, there was twice as many cats present when 30% of the cats were removed, but the food source and the habitat was not altered. So what does that mean? By having an animal management strategy consisting of ad hoc removal of cats that is not intensive enough to result in eradication and is not paired with modifying the environment to remove the food source and decrease the carrying capacity and exclude new immigration of cats. We have been chronically destabilizing cat populations in our community and having as much as 200% of the cats that we otherwise would have with nothing. This is with, even without adding the benefits of TNR return to field. We have been inflating cat populations and increasing all the harm and risk associated with more breeding of cats. 
that was a painful realization for me to have as somebody who had been so invested in this system and carried the system out with such good intentions. You know, I said at the beginning, I'm a cat lover before anything. But the great news is this tool that wasn't working very well, when we set it down and replace it with a better solution, the impact is profound, not only for cats, but for the whole ecosystem that they are a part of. So when we take feral cats and we return them to their habitat, instead of euthanizing them or relocating them, it reduces crowding illness and euthanasia in shelters. And that is a win, right? That's a win for the shelters. That's a win on costs. It's a win on staff morale. It reduces feline birth and it reduces the translocation and migration of cats into a newly open spots in the community. And that's probably why we see less roaming and less dead cats on the road. It also addresses the source of many nuisance complaints because those are often associated with cats that are intact and are mating and breeding. And it stabilizes community cat populations, not perfectly, right? In both of those studies I showed, there was still some cat intake, but it reduces them better than any other method that we have available to us. So that's pretty good. And that, when we first introduced Return to Field, that was enough. It was a program for feral cats that weren't candidates for adoption. And I still understood that the preferred outcome for a friendly cat was adoption. And really, we only put it on the Return to Field path. It was in the middle of summer and there were so many kittens around and this was kind of a plainly packaged little kitty and we knew it wasn't gonna have a good chance for adoption, then we would consider returning it. Um, and we, we really saved the adoptive homes for the cats that couldn't go back safely. And the focus that we talked about then was providing for fates better than death. That was a pretty low bar. But as we've seen these programs play out, we've come to understand that there's also, a, there's another role for return to field with friendly cats. Remember, our very first goal, our first mandate as an animal, a public animal shelter, a repository for found pets, is to reunite them with the people who love them. And if you have ever loved and lost a cat, you know how important a role this is for us to play, right? I lost my cat, my first cat, Pussy Willow, when I was 10. That was 45 years ago, and I still think about her, right? I don't know what happened. And what we know is that cats and dogs are not just the same animal in different packages, right? There are significant differences between puppies and kittens, cats and dogs. And here's one difference. When we look at the methods by which dogs and cats are reunited with their owners, we find that about one in three dogs in 2007 were reunited with their owners by a call or a visit to an animal shelter. Not too bad. By contrast, fewer than one in 10 cats was reunited with their family by a call or a visit to an animal shelter. That's because people's expectations about cats, what they do when they're lost and how long they're gone, um, differ. You know, when your dog's lost, you're like, I definitely, I had a dog this morning. He is definitely not here. He's not hiding under the bed. You know, he's not stuck amongst my shoes. Like he's definitely gone. And so you go look for him, right? But with the cat, you're like, I, have you seen the cat? I don't know. Have you seen the cat? I don't know. You know, it's a few days. And also cats behave differently when they're lost. A lot of times the reason a cat is lost is either because she's been lured next door by someone who's feeding her better than she's getting at home. And so she's just being disloyal. Or something scared the cat. And it went to ground and it got into a shed or it got itself into a state. And oftentimes cats will wait days or even a few weeks before they emerge to be found. And so there's a disconnect between when cats are lost and when they're found and when they might be in a shelter and when people are looking. Either the people look too late or the cats aren't even there by the time the people are done looking. There's just a disconnect. And this was in 2007 when there was less technology to reunite people with their pets um, without a visit to an animal shelter than there is now. In a 2012 sur survey, this was replicated, but it was even more profound. Cats were more than 50 times more likely to be reunited with their families through being either returning home on their own or through something that happened in their neighborhood of origin than by a call or a visit to an animal shelter. 
And so what that tells us is that by allowing the public to bring cats to the shelter and not returning them, we are reducing by as much as 50 fold the likelihood that those cats will ever be reunited with their family. So it's not just that return to feel is a fate better than death. Return to feel might be the fastest pathway a cat has to get back home to the people that care about her. And again, not a fluke. A subsequent study found that cats were actually more likely to be found inside the house where they were lost than by a call or a visit to an animal shelter. So we just see, you know, this is one of those hair dryer hammer things where bringing a cat into a shelter, not a very good way to get the cat back to its owner. And importantly, I've come to see this really as kind of a social justice issue. This is, the impact of this is not neutral across income levels. And people who are in the lowest income bracket are the most likely to never be reunited with their lost cats. Whereas people who make $100,000 or more, 100% of the time, found the cats when they had lost them because they had the wherewithal they knew about the shelter. They have a car, they have a computer, they have a phone, and they speak English and they understand the system, they can get their cat back. We don't want to be part of a system that disproportionately takes animals away from people who are already marginalized and disadvantaged in so many other ways. So I've come to understand that return to field actually is sort of raises this image of this mythical field that the cats are getting back to. Whereas very often when we say return to feel, what we're really doing is returning cats to their owners. It bypasses the mismatch in timing and in search methods and in cultural expectations that people have, where for a lot of people, the background that they come from, it would never occur to them in a million years that that cat that they love and named and feed somebody would bring it to a centralized location and would get put in a cage. And if they don't show, show up within three or five days, gets given to someone else. It just never occurred to them. And that's not their reality. And so it bypasses all that. And these are a couple little boys being reunited with their cat. You just see the joy in their face. And it is the most direct method we have available to really educate people in the experience of what's it like to have a spayed cat. What's vaccination mean? It means the cat's gonna be healthier. She's gonna do better and they can tell their neighbors and become advocates again to help with partnerships that can do targeted TNR to help the other cats in that community. Another difference between cats and dogs is just the expectation and the, the reality of containment. Cats roam. And they don't roam along sidewalks like we do. They roam across back fences. And so a cat can just be doing its cat life and not actually be lost at all. And yet be show up somewhere that's quite far from its home. This is a fun, um, I will provide these slides if you want to follow up on any of these links. It's a fun thing where they put GPS cat collars on cats in England and tracked where they were going. You can kind of see how this cat by jumping over back fences she was going into backyards of, cat, of houses that by road were several miles away. You have to travel quite a ways to get there. And this is some research done by a shelter director who started mapping, in fact, where cats were found and where they lived. And this is a cat that was found and brought into the shelter from a house that was quite a long way, this blue and red line, from the house where it lived as people drove, but just a hop, skip, and a jump as cats walk. And they were, she was brought into the shelter as a lost cat on the last day that the family had seen her. So she wasn't lost at all. She just ended up at the shelter. Fortunately, this fat cat was microchipped and she was quickly reunited with her owner. But again, not everybody has access to microchips. Not everybody knows about that. No, not everybody has access to ID collars and tags. One in six people in America live in poverty. One in five Americans speak a language other than English at home. And cultural norms and expectations around free roaming cats really vary. And we need to serve all of those communities that are part of the greater community in which we live. And 90% of people in underserved communities have never been to a shelter at all. So remember that, you know, this, this idea that like my cat at a shelter, what? And here's another reality. We know that 
for Americans in general, 30 to 40% of cats are adopted from a shelter or a rescue source. But in our most underserved communities, 3% are adopted from a shelter or rescue source. So they don't know about us and they don't necessarily have access to the spay, neuter and vaccination that would be part of adopting a cat from a shelter. And so very often when a friendly, unspayed, unneutered cat comes into a shelter, that's not a lost cat. That is just someone's pet in a disadvantaged community. That's part of that 97% of cats that are adopted from a source other than a shelter that hasn't been spayed or neutered, but has a name, has a family, and is valued. And so by sterilizing and returning those cats, again, we open doors to a whole nother experience of being a pet owner, of what it's like to have an animal that's spayed or neutered, that's not having babies, that's not so skinny, that's not causing problems, that's not peeing on the walls, in a way that no amount of preaching to elementary school students in theory would ever accomplish. So I made that slide just sort of thinking about, like, this is the way it should work. And it wasn't that long after that I saw this story, um, and it was in a profile of a community cat program. And it was the story of Star. She's, she's the light of Myra's life. She had lived for more than 10 years in her Texas home. So 10-year-old cat, not our best adoption candidate, right? Kind of hard to place. One day, someone in the neighborhood saw, saw her outside, scooped her up, brought her to the nearest shelter. She's friendly. And in the old days, we would have just like put her up for adoption, right? Prior to the community cat program, she would have joined hundreds of other cats sitting in cages, waiting for her family to find her. Myra would never have known. She would never have come. But she didn't need to, because thanks to the community cat program, she was examined, vaccinated, spayed, and returned, and loaded back into the community cat van and returned back to the address where she was originally found, and that's when Myra found out that Star wasn't gone for good. She was right there, happy to be home, bursting into tears. You can just see the love in that picture. And Myra then became an advocate for Spay Nader in her own community, in her own language, with the people that looked like her, and helped to stabilize the cat populations and support cats and their families in that whole neighborhood. So what we know, you know, just like we know that maybe more cats were getting hit by cars and maybe there are more cats in communities than there needed to be, by not returning friendly cats when there was evidence by their body condition, by the condition that, the, by the situation they came from that they did have an owner, we've actually been breaking those bonds and that's the last thing we would ever want to do. So this is kind of where I've come to now. Return to field can be an alternative to euthanasia for cats that aren't good candidates for adoption, but it also can be a fast track to return to owner and closing the loop on adoptions. And as a bonus, it can minimize the time that cats spend in the shelter and free up shelter resources for those cats that really do need to come in for one reason or another. This is just a sign, you know, and this, the, the, the cost of competition from a bunch of other friendly cats can be kind of hidden in a shelter that has a high live release rate, like Long Beach. You can say, you know, 90% of the cats get out alive eventually. But this was a cat in a shelter that had a greater than 90% live release rate. This is Ebony. And it says, I'm very sweet, but I dislike prolonged petting. Please keep interactions short. I can go home today. I took this picture 79 days after that cat was admitted to the shelter and she'd been sitting in that cage for 79 days because a little skinny black cat who dislikes prolonged petting and gets easily overstimulated just can't compete against a hundred other cats. And she can't necessarily have all the space that she needs to show that maybe she isn't all that easily overstimulated. Maybe she's a nicer cat, but she's in such a cramped cage that, that she's not showing her true friendly personality. So she might have been a cat that sat in the shelter for 80 days, eventually got a chronic respiratory infection, and ended up in that 10% that was euthanized that we still think of as like, that's a very successful shelter. But that was one cat who suffered a lot more than she needed to and may not have ultimately made it out alive.
And I imagine that the staff at Long Beach can show, tell some stories like this is a cat at a shelter that used to have every single one of these condos full upstairs and downstairs with a cat. And on this day after their community cat program was in full swing, he was the only guy in the whole building. So they just gave him the room. And they're like, forget the cage, <laughs> just have this whole room. And of course, with no competition, this kind of grouchy eight year old jowly cat was adopted in about five minutes. So um, that was a lot of science, but it really comes down to just really matching the right tool with the right job. Using our hair dryer to dry our hair, using our hammer to hammer a nail. And for most healthy unowned cats, healthy is important. Whether they're friendly or whether they're feral, return to field, return to owner, or return to home. Sterilization return is the best option for the feral cats to stabilize population in the community and limit euthanasia at the shelter, and for friendly cats to maximize the spayed and neutered and vaccinated cats that are safe at home with their family, and as an avenue to open doors of communication with populations of people that we have traditionally marginalized from the shelter system. The shelter pathway should be wide open and a red carpet rolled out for pet cats that need a new home, when we've tried to support the owner in keeping that cat or finding a home themselves, but they can't keep it anymore for some reason. For social kittens that need a new home, they're not adapted to the environment. They don't already have someone attached to them. So we need that red carpet to be wide open so they don't grow up out there where there's not the resources in the family for them. And for unhealthy cats, cats that aren't thriving where they are, cats that are in dangerous situations, cats that are causing a significant nuisance, cats that have been victimized by people who are cruel or neglectful. We want the shelter to have plenty of space for those cats. And importantly, cats that have been displaced by disasters where the, the family's been the victim of domestic violence. That's the true definition of what a shelter should be. We don't need to fill it up with healthy cats that we're doing fine where they are and can do even better if they're sterilized and vaccinated. It's important to sort of plan a general pathway like that, of like most healthy cats go back where they were found, kittens and pet cats that are surrounded go to adoption. But it's also important to have some exits from, so I think of those as like, those are the super highways, but it's also really important to look at the needs of each individual cat and make sure it can exit the super highway if that outcome isn't the right choice. So I just wanna go over a few examples of when cats should exit the superhighway. And I think that's, you know, sort of in the early days of these programs, one of the things we learned is that we have to be a little bit more attentive to when the individual situation requires an exception to the rule. Um, and for instance, if there's some kind of new risk at the location of origin, this cat is in good body condition, looks like it was doing fine, but, we talked to the person who found it and the warehouse where it was living just got torn down. So something changed. So it's not that there's like some theoretical risk that maybe like there's a cat that I walk by every night and he's about 50 feet from a huge intersection. And I've been walking by him for five years. He's fine. He's got it worked out. He would never goes near the intersection, even though it's nearby. But if there was something new there, then that's a concern or if the cat has a significant current health issue that requires ongoing monitoring or intervention to prevent real suffering. Not suffering that might happen sometime down the line years from now, but right now this cat has a concern. She or he is not doing well, doesn't have any eyes, you know, something like that that's preventing that cat from thriving. Or there's a significant environmental concern. There's ground dwelling, vulnerable bird species. It's a protected ecological habitat or it's just a nuisance colony of cats and the size needs to be reduced. We wanna reserve those working cat homes for those situations because we don't have an infinite number. And importantly, that's not a no risk option. Cats can leave working cat, cat homes. You know, they don't stick that well. And in trying to return back to where they were originally located, those cats incur significant risk and also can transmit diseases between areas in your community. So. Working cat homes, you know, it may feel like a less risk option, but oftentimes it's a higher risk option than return to the location of origin, unless there really is a significant problem there. Now, what about the friendly strays? 
you know, I said like a lot of times it's just somebody's pet cat that needs to go back home, but not always. And this happened to me last winter where my friend found a cat. It was a friendly stray cat. And I was like, well, don't take it to the shelter. Let's just like see if we can sterilize it and get it back to its home. But then, you know, as we petted the cat, we realized she was pretty skinny. Uh, so we posted her on next door. And we heard from somebody who lived next door to that house, like, oh yeah, those people were evicted three weeks ago and those cats have been hanging around. It's trying to get into my house. It's trying to break into my sliding door. So there's evidence that the cat has truly been abandoned. Something has changed where the cat had a home or the cat's own body condition is not good. That's telling us, no, the cat doesn't have access to a reliable food source. The cat's not being fed and cared for by somebody. Um, and still, if those cats are brought in, those friendly cats are brought in, it's important that there be a cat-specific strategy for increasing the number of cats that are returned to their owners that doesn't rely on the same methods that we count on for dogs. It's really helpful for that to have a few speed bumps for bringing cats into the shelter to do a good interview with the person who's bringing the cat in and say like, well, have you been feeding it fancy fees? So it's abandoned its original home. Maybe just like stop feeding it for a couple of days, see if it goes home. Have you tried posting anything on social media, on Facebook, on signs around your neighborhood? Have you talked to your neighbors from a safe and respectful distance wearing a mask? Before you even bring the cat in so that when it comes in the door, we have a good idea of like, yes, this cat is abandoned and needs a new home. No, this cat is not abandoned and needs to be sterilized and go back home. And then the final category is when should feral-ish kittens. So we said like the super highway for social kittens is like, yeah, if the finder doesn't want to keep them, if their friends can't take them, bring them on in. Let's find them homes. Let's prioritize the shelter for that. But for those cats that are hissy and spitty, um, we should consider having them exit the return to field super highway or that's actually exiting the, shel the shelter adoption superhighway and go to a return to field. Sorry, that's a, a mislabeled slide. When resources for socialization are exceeded, you just don't have the foster groups uh, in a shelter, in a cage, not a place to socialize feral cats, of course. So if you don't have the foster people to socialize them or they're just beyond the window for socialization. And one of the things that we've recognized as these return to field programs mature is that pushing cats into a socialization category because that's what you need to do to save their lives often doesn't succeed and those are the cats that end up coming back because they're peeing in the laundry basket because they didn't want to be social and so recognizing that the cat is not wanting to be social something that's interesting slide aside but uh, i'm really wrapping up this is my second to last slide um feralness is selected for behaviorally pretty quickly so genetic levels of socialization. So within a few generations, kittens that are born to a mom that has been skittish enough to succeed at being a feral cat in the wild and have those babies will become quickly less and less social and socializable. And even within a litter, there will be variation and in terms of the levels of sociability and the inclination of the kittens to get social. And I had an experience with a litter of kittens that my neighbor found behind her house and I got them at the right age. Um, when they were still young enough and I was able to socialize two out of the three but the third one she really didn't want to tame down and so that one we sterilized and put back and that was eight years ago and I still see her she's turned into this gorgeous cat who loves the person who cares for her and sits on her lap and lets herself be brushed but she does not ever want to step foot, step foot in a house so really recognizing like return to field not always the worst thing that can happen to a cat that really doesn't want to be a pet. But ideally, when you're returning these younger kittens to the field, recognize they're less likely to be adapted to that environment. Um, and so it's important, it's ideal to make more efforts there to identify somebody who can keep an eye on the kitten, who can be a caretaker to the kitten, and really importantly, find the mom. There was a kit kitten there. There's a mom somewhere. And this is a webinar from the kitten lady from Hannah Shaw that really has some excellent tips on how to follow up when you do have to return kittens to the field. Or when you don't, still find the mom. So I think the bottom line is we don't have a perfect solution. We don't have one magic tool that just makes all the problems with cats go away. But by using both tools available to us, and really thoughtfully evaluating the needs of each cat, 
and matching our response to those needs and using the partnerships that are available in the community to follow up to try and improve the situation over time to use those returns as an entree to do more sterilization and education. We can maximize the chance that cats that have homes will go back to those homes. Cats that need new homes will be successfully adopted out. Cats that are thriving without reproducing can go on thriving in the community. And cat populations and the associated risks and harms for people and wildlife, and importantly, the cats themselves, will be reduced as much as we possibly can. So that is the end. And I look forward to hearing what questions people have about all of that. I'm loving some of the questions I'm seeing in the chat. Why can't all shelters dot return to field? They should all be able to, right? Every shelter should have a hammer and a hair dryer. We shouldn't have to use always a hair dryer or always a hammer. Every shelter should be empowered to use the tool that's right for the situation. And I can take a look in the chat, keep answering questions, or I can just like go find my cat and show them off to you. But it looks like some of these questions are um, really best addressed by um, our folks from Long Beach Animal Service. Sorry about that. I was going to go and my interpretive dance. Here. Yeah, we could now I'm going down the stairs. Um, you know, Dr. Yeah. Hurley, we just. <laughs> <laughs> We thank you so much for all of that. And we'll go ahead and answer a couple of these quick questions while we fill in more for you. Um, one of the questions on here is, um, have we had any trouble with neighbors uh, returning the cats or do you identify feeders before releasing them? Um, no, we don't identify feeders before releasing a cat because as Dr. Hurley stated earlier in the program, our criteria is what does the condition of the cat look like? So that's our initial criteria. If the veterinarian of the shelter determines that the cat's in good condition, then we are to assume that that cat is receiving food and care by someone and more than likely many people out there in the field. Um, we do, if it's a, a questionable area, uh, we may go take a walk of the area first. Um, if it's a person that's turning in cats from multiple different areas, that's going to alert us. Uh, here in Long Beach, we've really fine-tuned our intake. Uh, so when um, we have intake coming in, um, when the shelter is open, and now even though with the managed intake, the officers, if they're going out and picking up the cat, we know the cat came from that area. So that's, a, that's easy. But if they've made an appointment and they're bringing a cat in, we have a pretty detailed intake form, which has been developed over probably a three or four year period to really specify what we're looking for. And then if there's any questions, we will call the person, the calling party or the reporting party to see if we can get more information. As we're transitioning, uh, the officer taking my position here, uh, Dr. Uh, officer Sorensen, uh, she's actually even doing a better job than I think we have done with really getting the background in there. And the reason for that is as we're transitioning, one of the things, and I'll let Stacy kind of expand on this, one of the things that uh, was the goal uh, as they're moving into the next phase of RTF is really focusing on that community involvement, much like Dr. Hurley was talking about, reaching out to these people who maybe are struggling uh, with food, resources, what have you, and see where the needs are, not only with the community cats, but with the dogs and with all of these other things that they couldn't previously do before they had the community cats under control. So do you want to kind of expand on that a little bit? Um, well, I, th I think, yeah, it's really about making sure that you have good conversations with people 
uh, when they raise concerns about anything. And I think the stray cat issue is a great jumping off point for people, right? So when people come to us and they have questions about um, stray cats or what to do, you know, it's not just a, oh yeah, go get it fixed and put it back. It's sort of about, you know, what's going on in your neighborhood? What are you seeing? Um, to really get a better understanding of what's going on with the animals in that area. So, um, yeah, I think, and there's a couple of other really good questions here too. Yeah, I think one of the questions we see up here, and I'm going to let Dr. Hurley answer it, uh, is how do we get our shelter to develop an RTF program? Gosh, um, you can always reach me at sheltermedicine at ucdavis.edu or um, reach out to us at info at milliancatchallenge.org. And sometimes for the shelter, it's a question of like, they just don't know about the return to field as an option. Um, sometimes it's a question of lack of resources. They don't, maybe they don't have the veterinary ability to get the sterilization part of it done. And sometimes the way it turns out is they really need a community partner to help make those returns happen. And so I think that's where as a cat advocate, um, if you don't work in a shelter, you can still be a really powerful partner um, and supporter of these programs. And thank you, Dr. Hurley. Another question, I'm gonna give this to Stacy. Uh, if I suspect a cat is feral or a community cat, should I call Long Beach Animal Care Services? And Stacy, before you address that, I wanna answer terminology because I'm big on terminology. So uh, a community cat comprises any cat that's unowned or loosely owned outside. So that could be a feral or a friendly cat or one of those little guys in between. So a community cat is just somebody that's living their best life outside doing their own thing. Uh, so we are not looking at behavior to determine a community cat. We're just simply looking at do they live outside are they loosely owned or have an owner or a caregiver or are they kind of romping around their whole life doing whatever they want to do? That's a community cat. So Stacy, I'll let you answer the rest of that question. Sure. So um, if somebody, if you are uh, one of our citizens that we serve in one of our service cities and you have questions about cats in your area uh, and you want to help, you certainly can contact us. Um, but it's always best if you're encountering a cat to um, trap that cat. Uh, if it's not already fixed, usually you can tell that that cat is fixed because a, it'll have a little bit of its ear tip removed. Um, so you can usually tell from a distance if a cat has been fixed. Uh, we certainly want to reserve shelter resources, just like Dr. Hurley was talking about, for animals that need to be in the shelter and need our care. So that is, those are cats that are abandoned and are suffering and are in dangerous situations that need help. Cats that are simply living you know, healthy in the community and you simply want to get them fixed, um, we can provide support services to do that. We can give you a spay neuter voucher. We can lend you a trap. Um, so we can give you all the tools that you need to safely trap that cat and uh, help you get it fixed at a clinic um, where it's not gonna be out of your pocket. Another question uh, is, if I see a cat in a shelter kennel for adoption and the cat is ear tipped, can I assume that that cat has been originally RTF but was social enough to adopt? adopt? Um, I'm going to answer that and then I'm going to ask Dr. Hurley to kind of expand on that a little bit. So just because we see a cat in a kennel with an, RT with an ear tip, doesn't mean anything about his behavior to us. What that means in our programs is that we determined along with the shelter management that there was a reason we couldn't return that cat. Uh, as Dr. Hurley stated earlier, when her friend was a, found a kitten or a cat, Dr. Hurley, um, and they found out that the cat was, that the people had moved out, they had been evicted. Um, Maybe we did the surgery. We, we do the pre-surgeries here. So we, we assume we're going to RTF that cat and then uh, we figure out maybe we can't. And so oftentimes you'll see a cat in a kennel with an ear tip. Also, maybe he just got over being sick because our shelter is treating. Uh, so maybe he got just got a surgery and he's sitting there waiting to go out. 
But let me say, that also doesn't mean you can't adopt him. You can adopt him. If he's there and he's available for adoption and you want him, by all means, take him. Um, we also have a, a, what we call a garden gnome program here. And this is for these little in-between cats that Dr. Hurley was talking about a little bit where, you know, we don't know that it's really the best thing to put out, but we also know this cat probably doesn't want to be my pet. So what we have found, and we did this last year very successfully, uh, is that we promoted garden cats. And we live in an urban environment, so we're not going to have a barn cat program here in Long Beach. But what we can have is a garden program. And we did 40 cats last year, about 40 cats, mostly under a year old, that did not want to uh, be adopted. And they did not qualify for the program for one reason or another. Mostly they had grown up in the shelter. They were sick. We treated, continued to be sick. By that time, you can't put them out. So we uh, taught people how to properly relocate a cat. We provided cages and follow-up, and every one of those cats is doing really, really well. Uh, so that was a program that was able, again, to be grown out of having an RTF program. And Dr. Kate, I'd like you to kind of expand a little bit more on reasons why we don't put out cats and reasons why we do put out cats. And I know that most of the questions are coming based on friendly strays. Yeah. Um, that there is not really a criteria for a reason to put a cat out or not to put a cat out. Right. When this program began, it was seen as like, this is an alternative to euthanasia for cats that are not friendly enough to be adopted. But then as we started doing the program and putting the cats back, we recognized that for any cat in good body condition, if it was friendly, that actually told us it was even more likely to have an owner or a caregiver in the community that really valued that cat. So instead of asking, is the cat friendly or feral to decide if it qualifies for the return to field program? Now the question we ask is, is there evidence that the cat is truly lost, abandoned, at risk in the community? And therefore we'll take it into the shelter and place it in the adoption program. I hope that makes sense. If it seems like the cat is thriving in the community, if it's feral, we put it back because we can't adopt it out. If it's friendly, we put it back because that tells us it has an owner and we don't want to take it away from that owner. So, so if you see a cat that is ear tipped and in the shelter and it has been rejected from the return to field program, quite likely it was because when, you know, as Anna described, when the return was being made, something was identified about that made that situation inappropriate. Maybe you went to return it and like, oh, you know, like there's not even a house there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not going to return this cat. Or when you went to return the cat, she cowered in the trap and she was like, no, no, I don't know where this place is. Like, take me back, please. So it's really important that we, we have these general principles of if the cat is doing well, and there's no hazards in the environment, we put it back, but we also make exemptions when appropriate when we get some more information. And that's exactly. really the benefit of as these programs mature and we understand better and have more and more options so that like here, the sort of intermediate hissy spitty kitten, it's not social, it's not gonna be a good candidate for adoption, but also there's nobody really to keep an eye on it where it came from, let's put that into the GNOME program. So we increase the number of appropriate options that we have for individual situations. Thank you, Dr. Hurley. Um, you know, a lot of folks have questions and concerns about, you know, cats and how they're faring when they are community cats. Um, and there's a question, a couple of questions about um, why should the community be, why should the community be expected to care for community cats? Um, and isn't there a law against abandoning animals? Um, and there's this is a specific reference to California Penal Code 597S, which um, prohibits abandonment. So why is, is it, um, why is it the community's job to take care of these animals? And how is this not abandonment? Well, remember, um, remember that I, I expected that removing cats from the environment meant there would be fewer cats in the environment. But now science and studies have shown us that removing cats from the environment 
means there's more cats in the environment. It's counterintuitive, but it's true and there's strong science behind it. So what the shelter was doing previous to the return to field program likely was increasing the number of cats free roaming in the community. So these programs aren't making there be more cats. These programs are actually improving the health and decreasing the care needs of the cats that are already in the community. Remember, we're going from three cats in the alley behind the house to two cats in the alley behind the house and fewer kittens. Um, and the body condition of these cats shows us that they are already receiving care. And very often it's a different person who's bringing the cat in than the person who's providing that care. So it's not a, you know, the person who's bringing the cat in doesn't have to provide care for the cat. The cat goes back to wherever he or she was getting food, but it's ideal when there is a partnership, a public private partnership often works best for this to then go and say to the person who is providing care, Hey, can we give you a little help? We sterilize this one. Are there any others that you're feeding? Can we help you sterilize those too so that they don't go on to become a problem for your neighbors and the community in general? So I guess that would be an answer to um, the question of, you know, why should why is it the community's burden? It's not the community's burden, but these cats are there. They're out there, they're accessing food sources. And very often we can mitigate the harm, mitigate the problems and improve the health of the cats and the community by sterilizing them and returning them versus removing them and destabilizing the environment. And then to the abandonment law, we really need to look at what's the intent of that law, was to protect animal well-being and to encourage responsible ownership. That law applies to people, not animals, right? And improving the fitness of an animal to survive and thrive in the community increasing the opportunity that an animal will be reunited with its owner is not meeting the spirit of a law intended to prevent abandonment. Just as for, for decades now, we've had TNR programs that operate in communities where like, if you wanna trap a cat in your alley, you can bring it in to a clinic and have it sterilized and you can put it back and it's gonna be better off for it. And that doesn't make you the owner of the cat or the abandon, abandoner of the cat just because you picked it up, made it better, and put it back. Um, it's not, it doesn't meet the criteria of permitting it to go without care. In fact, you have evidence that it was receiving care and you made it so that it would be in better condition. Um, thank you for that, uh, Dr. Hurley. Um, Good timing for, for the pirate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I will also just, uh, you know, say, just say hello. from an animal control perspective, this is a question that, um, that I've been asked uh, a lot, and that is, you know, um, how aren't you abandoning the, the animal? And what we're doing is we're, we're interfering and stopping a breeding cycle. And in fact, we're ensuring that animals are going back to the place where they were getting excellent care. So um, it is, in many ways, the argument for RTF is a lack of abandonment and to ensure that animals are not abandoned. Um, in terms of having the community, you know, expected to care for these animals, um, RTF isn't about making people care uh, for animals that they're not willing to care for. In fact, it's making it easier for them to provide the care that community members are already do providing. And it's um, giving education to folks uh, and giving them more resources and support uh, to do the work that they've already been doing um, and to ease the burden uh, on the community. So. Um, you know, the shelter does not operate in a vacuum and neither does any particular community member. Uh, and we all impact the work of each other, whether it's programs that I as the shelter director implement or actions that individuals take on the street uh, regarding animals, they all impact um, each other. So uh, this is really about bringing the community together for the welfare and benefit of the animals and making the best decisions for animals in their particular circumstances. And I think they, that's a really good point. One of the early sort of things we learned about this program, you know, I thought people would really be angry about, you know, they brought the cat in to have it gone, you know, and they would be mad. And every once in a while somebody is mad, but far more often the response is, God, if I had known it would just be spayed and returned, I would have brought it in, 
years ago, you know, like people, people value the cats. They don't want to do something harmful to the cat. Maybe they love their own cat, but they're in over their heads in terms of the breeding and all of the nuisance associated with cats that are intact. And so actually by making this tool available to shelters to serve their community, we serve a much broader part of the community population. Definitely. Um, we have we'll a, one more question. Huh? We'll do one more question. Yeah. This last one is kind of a sad question because we can't really help you. Um, <laughs> but I'm going to give you some resources and some ideas. Um, this comes from a, a, a lady who lives in downtown LA. And she says, uh, I live in downtown LA area and there are several cats around my community. What is the best way to catch a feral cat and for him to participate in the TNR program? Unfortunately, in the city of LA, um, they've had a long-standing injunction against TNR. Um, it's very intricate and could be another four-hour program easily, so we're not going to get into too much detail on it. However, there has been some movement forward. I don't say this to discourage you from doing some TNR. What it means is that you cannot take that cat to any city facility to get surgery or um, any veterinarian, um, any veterinarian in LA city, uh, they're not supposed to provide surgery uh, for trapped cats. That's not to say though, you can't uh, do this. We do have some veterinarian resources outside the city of LA uh, that we can uh, possibly direct you to and uh, people outside of the city of LA that can loan you traps and teach you how to do this. So thank you so much for your heart for these cats. The injunction unfortunately has not um, been real favorable uh, in the eyes of a lot of people in the community because the people do, like Dr. Hurley has said, they want to help. We see this. They want to help just like you do. So if you would please email me at Anna, A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, at straycatalliance.org, and I will give you those resources outside of the city of LA that could possibly help you. But you cannot do anything due to the injunction within the city of LA. So I think that's going to be our last question. And we want to thank all of you um, for taking part of this. You can email any of the three of us with any questions. Dr. Hurley has provided her information. I've provided mine. Stacy, do you want to provide yours? Yeah, I think we're going to be sending um, this information out to the participants. So you'll have our contact information. Um, and I believe we're providing a recording of this uh, to you as well. Definitely. And uh, Dr. Hurley, would you like to close with anything? Um. Sure, I'll just mention, I'm happy to make a PDF of my slides available if anybody wants the, um, you know, I purposely clipped enough of the studies so that you could easily Google those and find the, the whole thing if you want to delve into the details. And um, just thank you again for, for the work that you've done in Long Beach that has really been pioneering for shelters across California and the US. And thank you to everybody here who's helping to make this extraordinary program happen. Um, I think, you know, as I said, I've been doing this for a long time, started when I was just a pup in animal welfare and never thought I would come to see the day where um, just a public animal shelter like Long Beach Animal Care and Services would be able to offer the range of choices and support for the community for cats that you guys are able to do. It's really like beyond what I ever would have predicted or hoped for. And I think it's just, it's so exciting. Um, that we've gotten to this point in animal welfare. So thank you. Thank you. And I still see a lot of questions coming in and we do want to get to those. Uh, so again, feel free to email us. If you're watching us on um, Instagram or Facebook, you can get, get us through there and it will be forwarded to us and we will answer every question that you're sending, I promise. So with yeah. that said, thank you so much for joining us. Bye, everybody. Have a great evening. Bye.